Hello everyone, it's Ryan Salins, and today I'm at the Nebraska Medicine Specialty Care Center to speak with Dr. Gina Mora. Because healthcare facilities can be places that are very exciting for transgender people, but there can also be a lot of anxiety because of past negative experiences or working with providers that don't actually know what they're doing when working with transgender patients. So today is our opportunity to talk with an actual healthcare provider that is extremely competent in the care that she provides to learn more tips and tricks on how to be more inclusive environments for transgender people. So a little self-disclosure, even though I do a lot of training in healthcare, I still get nervous whenever I'm in an exam room just because of the own, my own personal experiences uh, with some healthcare providers. So I'm excited to be talking with Dr. Gina Mora. Hi. Hey Ryan, <laughs> great to see you. Great to see you too. So that we can all have a little bit more information uh, and more tools in our tool belt before we go in to advocate for our health. So Gene, today I really would like to talk to you about three different topics. Okay. The first topic is I'd like to talk to you about affirming healthcare facilities. The second topic, a topic that I feel is not actually talked about that often, is what to know surrounding hysterectomies and being a transgender man. And then the last topic, another one that many people are not talking about but it's very important, is fertility options and family planning for uh, transgender people. Does All that right. sound good? Sounds great. All right, great. So let's begin then uh, with affirming healthcare facilities. Yeah. You've done a great job here at the Specialty Care Center for Nebraska Medicine in creating a, an affirming facility. So I was actually hoping you could share with everyone what you've done uh, to do that. Yeah, so I think one of the key things that I found is being sure that all the staff are ready to work with transgender patients. And it doesn't take a lot, but it's really some critical steps. Um, including making sure that all the staff understand that people's names are important, um, that it's not all about people's legal names, um, and knowing what name they want to go by, and using the right pronouns. And so some of the stuff is simple, but it can really make or break a patient's experience about how they feel and whether they feel seen and affirmed when they're getting their health care. Um, and you just don't want that to be a distraction for the patient that they feel like they're already having to battle something or to prove themselves. You just want it to be a welcoming place where they're really seen. Um, in this particular facility, it's been wonderful because we've got, you know, easy access at the door so people don't get stressed out with parking and all that. And also they come in and it's a small welcoming lobby with, <clears throat> you know, artwork and magazines and things that are um, welcoming, I think, to everyone. There certainly are signals to the LGBT community that this is a welcoming place, whether that is um, rainbow flags and ribbons or the HRC quality symbol and things that the, that the clinic carries out, that the staff carries out. We, we've made the bathrooms all gender neutral. Mm -hmm. And so just step by step, all these little pieces of the way that, that the clinic runs that I think add to the overall effect that patients just feel like they, this is a place that is welcoming to them. Great. And then what happens, for example, someone's coming into the exam room for the first time, meeting yes. you for the first time, what do you do or what advice would you actually have for providers if they're watching? Um, to help ease that anxiety and start building that relationship with the patient. Yeah, so, you know, when the patients are coming to see me, it's really already known that they've made this appointment because they want to talk about medical transition is, is usually the reason for their appointment with me. Um, but even for providers that are in primary care, where that may just come out in the conversation, I think it's important to acknowledge that um, this may be a scary or perceived as a difficult visit for that patient. And so to acknowledge that um, you appreciate that they trusted you enough to disclose that to you. Um, and also what I like to do when I know that the whole conversation is going to be around um, starting hormones, that I kind of lay out for them at the very start of the, of the clinic visit what this visit is going to look like because I just I find that it just helps 
ease the tension in the room. Um, many people feel very anxious about getting any kind of health care, but certainly about talking in depth about their um, gender identity it, as it relates to their health care and because they may have had very negative experiences. So I go through with patients that at the visit today we're going to be talking about your gender identity and your, your history with your disclosure um, and um, what aspects of your life you may or may not be living in your affirmed identity and just to try to get a sense of what other resources I may be able to bring to bear to their visit today. Um, I'm also going to ask them to go through pretty detailed medical history with me to see if there are any things that need to be addressed as we go forward with thinking about starting hormone therapy. And then I'm going to go over kind of my, my points of teaching them about the hormones themselves. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, about what the hormones do, what they don't do, trying to dispel maybe some myths that may be, that may be out there. Frequently patients come in are quite well educated already. They've really researched this themselves. Um, but I want to make sure that I, I don't make any assumptions about people's prior knowledge. And so I make sure that I take everybody through all of the key facts that they need to know about hormone treatment. Um, usually from that point they um, I'm going to answer address any of their the questions that they have at that moment but then at that point they're probably going to get blood work drawn which we actually do in the facility here so they don't have to go to a separate lab um, and then we make arrangements for the next follow-up appointment which is typically a couple of weeks later certainly to to give me a chance to review their medical background, review the labs, and also to give them a chance to think about other further questions and things that they may have. And then we'll actually start the hormones after that second visit. An important thing that I point out right at the outset is that um, I do not typically do any physical exam on the day of the first appointment. It's really just us talking. I need to hear lots of information from them, they want to get information from me, and then I want to field any questions that they have. But we're not going to do any um, physical exam at that point. And in truth, even when they come back for their follow-up visit, the physical exam that I need to do to start their hormones is a really a general physical exam. It does not need to involve chest or breast exam. It does not need to involve pelvic exam. Mm -hmm. I certainly would offer that to patients if they were due for screening and wanted to have screening physical exam done, I'm happy to do that. But it's not a requirement to start hormones and that can be a real anxiety producing thing I think for a lot of patients. So I like to just be sure to set that out right at the beginning of what is going to be done today and even what's going to be done at the follow-up visit. Great. And with everything that you've done, there still could be an opportunity that maybe someone has a, I don't, I don't want to say bad experience, but an experience that maybe made them feel a little bit uncomfortable, not necessarily with you, but just in their visit. Mm -hmm. Do you encourage them to contact you and to let you know uh, when this happens? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think a lot of what, what I've worked to create is, as I've made this clinic, is built on the feedback from patients, positive and negative. Um, and as I mentioned at the, at the beginning of realizing that staff training is the key to it, um, that, that's coming from patients when they say that even if their experience with me was fine, but maybe experience when they called to make the appointment was less than ideal, then I know we need to work on that. Um, and even from a larger standpoint, not just what happens right in this clinic, but in the hospital facility in general, just Nebraska medicine in general, um, there's tremendous support for these patients. There are people listening, even if you may not, as an individual patient, necessarily see that or feel like you know where to go. There, all patients will be getting a patient satisfaction survey. They really listen to what goes into that. Um, we're, you know, I would encourage people to identify that if they struggled in any way, 
with the fact that they are transgender to identify that. These are anonymous surveys. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> and to specify that this was, was a barrier in their care somehow because it does get the attention of the organization and they really are working to try to make it a better experience for patients so that, you know, we think about not just, again, in this particular clinic, but a trans patient who has to go to an ENT doctor or a family medicine doctor or anywhere, um, or they have an ultrasound exam done or, you know, you name it, there's so many different ways that any of us interact with the hospital system. I would strongly encourage people, give immediate feedback to me, give email feedback to me after the fact, um, and to the patient relations office and fill out your surveys. The, the hospital as, a, as an organization is very interested in serving the transgender population well. Mm -hmm. And so you hear it from a doctor herself. Mistakes do happen, especially when you're in large healthcare systems or hospital facilities. Um, you may be misgendered, someone may use the wrong pronoun, some people may not know why you're there for the visit, and they look at physical appearance and make a quick judgment. So it's extremely important to be able to advocate for your health, to fill out those surveys, and to share with folks what your experience has been because it's gonna help improve those healthcare facilities, not only for you in the future, but for other people as well. So I really wanna thank you, Dr. Amora, for sharing your experience in creating a more affirming healthcare facility. Please tune in for the two other videos we're gonna be doing, one on hysterectomies and transgender men, and two on family planning and fertility options for transgender folks. So thank you, everyone, and thank you, Jean. Thanks.